aside daily portions for the Levites, and the Levites set aside daily portions for Aaron's descendants. It's God's word. All right, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Um, my name is Ricky. I serve as one of the pastors here. Um, let's say that you were starting a team, starting a group, starting a business, maybe starting a church. You know, what would you want the culture of your group to be? Or right, if you could kind of make it anything, you're like, hey, this is what the, the values that we're all about. This is the culture of, of the team. This is who we are. This is what we do. What, were so, what would some of that culture and those values be that you would want for your group? This is a little bit of interaction. What, what, what do you got? What are some things you'd all want? Teamwork. Teamwork? Integrity. Integrity? Whoa, just win, winners? <laughs> um, just, uh, that is a very Emma answer. Just win. <laughs> just win, baby. Al Davis. Yeah. Any other ones? Right, I mean, yeah, right, right. We, we probably all, we, we can think of these things, right? And we could probably, or you feel it when it's off, right? You go into a workplace, you're part of a team, and you're like, after all, you're like, wait a minute, it's missing something. You know, it's, we, and we probably all pick these things because they're kind of, to a degree, at least some of them are kind of easy to see, right? We, teamwork. Hey, it's not just me, it's the team. We care for each other, we'll actually help other people out. Integrity, people are, people are playing fair, people are being honest. Humility, right? People, people are willing to learn, people are willing to own their mistakes if, if, they're, if they made some. You know, when Alex and I, you know, a few years, like several years ago, we were thinking about, okay, what, what about for us as City Light South, as we plant and God moves in the church, what are we hoping that God does? Not just like what programs are we gonna do, but what culture do we want to be as a church? This is just who we are. And we thought, man, we, were, we want to be a family, right? They, they, we're not here to attend something so much. We're here to be something together, a family together that really cares for one another, that, that is moving into relationships with each other. We wanted a place where people could be vulnerable, right? We're all here because we're by ourselves, we're lost, broken, sinful people in need of a savior, Jesus Christ. But a lot of times churches, you come in and it's like, hey, let's pretend everything's fine because we're awesome. And it's like, well, you know what? Life isn't always awesome. You're not always awesome. So let's have a church where it's just like, hey, we could talk about these things. We could be vulnerable, honest, but confess and move to repentance. One of the church that's just like, man, we pray. Man, things are going great. We pray. Man, things are hard. Let's go to God, we pray. I wanted to be a place that, that was like, man, we, we, God's word is central. Again, things are going great, God's word. If, things are, if life cuts us, we bleed God's word. I want to be a place that, that is committed to each other, united around the big things, not getting divided over the little things, and people that are running to the lost, that we care about this world. And, and in these things, we're not perfect. We want to continue to grow and God to shape that. But, but, you know, what would God say if he was asked the same question? God, who would you want your people to be? This is who they are. This is what they do. This is the culture, like a gospel culture. What would that look like? And in Nehemiah, so they, they've, just to kind of let you recap the story a little bit, they've, the, the, the city, Jerusalem, in, is in shambles. The people, uh, the Israelites have over and over again been just running away from God, rebelling against God, sinning, worshiping other gods. And so God brought them out of, out of the land and they were exiled to re, actually to discipline them, to ultimately restore them. And so now people are coming back and the wall, the city is in shambles. Jerusalem's like a ghost town. And, and God, it, it, like they, they get back in there and Nehemiah is there and they, they rebuild the wall. And in chapter six, it, boom, it's done. And then from chapter seven, and where we're kind of like culminating in with now in chapters 11 and 12, it's like this reboot, reset, relaunch of the people. And we see them getting their identity back as God's people. And so in this um, chapter eight, we see, all right, we're going to be God's people and we're going to read God's word. That's what they do all day for chapter eight. Chapter nine, they confess, confess their sins. All right, yep, we've sinned. We're going to own it, and we're going to repent and move back to God. Chapter 10, they're saying, we're going to be committed. 
This is, this is not just some religious thing that we're doing. This is not hobby. We are the people of our God, and that is our God. And so they make this covenant with God, and they're saying, because God's already been committed to them. And they're, they're just kind of re-upping their commitment to them. And, and then in 11 and 12, this is this high point of the story. And we, we finish off, what is God's people meant to be marked by? What is the culture of God's people? And not just for them then, but for us today. What, what should it be like? This is who we are. This is what we do. This is just so ingrained into us and our values. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. That's what we're going to be answering is what is that? And then how do we get there? Because, right, it's easy to be like, yep, we should be that, we should be that. But then how do we actually do that? How do we actually grow in being these, this kind of people? So if you've got a Bible, open up to Nehemiah 11. Nehemiah 11, it's before Psalms, before Job, um, before all that, but uh, it's right before Esther, right after Ezra. And so open up to Nehemiah 11. There's some Bibles in the back. Um, and, and so remember, the wall is built, but it's a ghost town. In chapter 7, it says the, the city is large and spacious, but there's very few people in it. There's not a lot of houses. And in chapter 11, kind of picks up with that problem because God, they, they need more people in the city. If God's going to rebuild his people... Israel, he's going to need to rebuild his city, Jerusalem. That, that's what they're going to have to do is they be a light to the nations. And so here's um, verse, or chapter 11, verse 1. Now the leaders of the people stayed in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots for one out of ten to come and live in Jerusalem. So it's like, all right, we need to repopulate the city, so we're going to cast lots. We don't do that today because we have the Holy Spirit. But casting lots is like, draw, hey, let's draw straws. You know, something like that. Let's roll the dice and see who it, who it lands on. And one out of ten is going to come live in the Jerusalem while the other nine-tenths remain in the towns. The people blessed all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. So, so God is moving. God is restoring his people, and so they're like, all right, we're going to figure out who's going to move back, and here's ultimately what they're doing. And this is point number one. First thing that we see here is God has a mission, so we move. God has a mission, and so we move, right? So people are volunteering. They're saying, God, God is doing things. God has a plan. We need to repopulate the city, so we'll all agree to kind of do like a at random lottery system to see who's going to move back. Because, and, and moving back to Jerusalem, it's not like fancy. This is not something that everybody's in line to do. Because again, it's a ghost town. Things are, a lot of the city isn't, isn't great. And if you're moving into the city, you're kind of putting a target on your back. Yeah, there's the walls, but, but if your enemies aren't going to focus on just like random scattered houses in the countryside, they're going to come to where there's resources, to where there's these, all of the offerings that are going to the temple. They're going to want to come there. And, and it, for you to leave Jerusalem, if you live in Jerusalem, it means you don't have very much land, you don't have very much animals, because you're in the city. And right here in verse 1, it says, now the leaders of the people stayed in Jerusalem. Man, that, that's what leaders do. I th we live kind of in a culture where leader means just being, in the, being the boss. You're at the top, and other people serve you. But biblical leadership, leadership according to Jesus is you're the first to serve. You're the first to sacrifice. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. And so we see these leaders saying, hey, we'll sacrifice first, but they still need more people. And so they're going to have to, to get more people to populate the city. They're going to have to look to people that live outside the city. And, hey, if you draw the short straw, you're going to move from wherever it is, somewhere else, to the city. I mean, have, you, have any of you ever moved? Right? Most, mostly all of us have sometime. When, you're, when I was in college, moving wasn't that big of a deal. You're like, well, I have my comforter and... <laughs> And I don't know, you know, box of cereal and a few, you know, and a million underwear. You know, that's like it. Easy. It all fits in the car. But we, we moved five years, five, six years ago, and it was awful. 
I mean, I can't imagine moving now with, again, with three kids. It's just like, oh, gosh. And then you find all this stuff where you're like, where's this? Do we, do we buy this? We, I hope we didn't buy this. Gosh, it's awful. But, but for, I mean, it's like a big deal. But for them, this is bigger, right? They can't just hop on Zillow and be like, where are we going to go? Right? They're not moving for a job. They're moving for a mission, right? They're not going to a job. They don't have one waiting there for them. And so this is this big cost, big sacrifice. And so, so when, when, they all, when they cast lots to see who's going, here's what the, they're all saying. This is their posture. They're saying God is going to decide who's going to move into the city, and whatever God decides, we will do. Whatever God decides. And, and why are they willing to do that? Because of God's kingdom, God's mission, God's purposes, God's on, God's on the move. So they're going to move with God. And so they're worshiping God with their lives, sacrificing for the purposes and the mission of God. And they're, they're putting God's mission ahead of their comfort, ahead of their ease, ahead of their preferences. And I, and I just want to say I'm, I'm thankful for you, church. I've seen so many people, so many of you, sacrifice for God's kingdom, opening up your homes, being generous with your, your, with, your, with your time, with your finances, to, to love people, to help other people engage, to know God, paint walls, build sheds. I mean, right now, there's tons of kids in all of these other rooms, and we have people just volunteering, right? And some of those people probably honestly just absolutely love kids and babies. And then there's some of them, it's like, you know what? I don't know if I love this, but somebody's got to change this diaper. It'll be me. And they'll, and they'll just be like, I'm just going to serve so that other people can engage with the word of God. And they're doing this unglamorous thing for what God is doing. And so these people here in Nehemiah, they have their yes on the table so that they can worship King Jesus. And we all worship something. Right, we're all worshipers, everyone. Right, the person in church is a worshiper, the atheist is a worshiper, the lady that's giving you coffee is a worshiper. Everyone's a worshiper. And so the question is, is what are you worshiping? Right, what, what are you giving worth to in your life, significance to, glory to? Right, we're built for this vertical relationship with God so that, that we know him, that we're giving him like like. The only thing that's actually big enough for us to have our life about, for us to, to put our soul on, is God. And we're built for that relationship, but, but sin gets into our lives, and usually that, that sin causes us to have this inward bent. We start worshiping our wants, our own desires. Right? We could come on a Sunday... We're going to sing and worship Jesus, and it's really easy to pivot the rest of the week away from Jesus. And so we're all worshiping something. And so if you're like, well, okay, well, how do I know what I'm worshiping? Here's a question that you could ask yourself to help you know, what am I worshiping? What do you willingly sacrifice for? All right, what do, you, what, do you, what do you sacrifice to make sure that you can do that, have that, participate in that, whatever it is? What do you sacrifice for? Right here, they're sacrificing their lives for God. They're worshiping God with their lives. What do you willingly sacrifice for and you hold as central to your life? And if you're like, yeah, it's Jesus, then do you, I mean, is there any evidence in your life that you're willingly or actually doing hard things to live for Christ? That, that you rearrange your schedule, your wallet, your life oh, around God and what he wants to do in your life and through your life? Are you willing to do hard things for your life, for, for Christ? Right? Hey, we, hey, do you have time for like a Bible study to get together and dig into God's word? <laughs> no, nah, you know, no, I don't really have time for that. All right, hey, are you willing to give, you know, to, to God, to worship God and to give to his mission? You know, my budget, no, no, I don't think that. I don't think I got that. Well, hey, what, what are you willing to do for Christ? I'm willing to sit in a service and listen to a sermon one or two times a month. I don't know if that's what Jesus came and died for. 
right? Yeah. Right. And, and, and this isn't to like guilt trip you. Because Jesus, he invites us into a greater joy. Right? This isn't just about like fall in line, do something. Jesus is inviting us into a greater joy than your career, than, than your activities, than your hobbies. Than your, even than your pocketbook or your nice house. He's inviting you into a greater joy than just like kind of some check boxes in your life. He invites us to himself, to, to knowing him, to be loved by him and to pouring our lives and joining him in what he is doing in this world, his mission. And so God has this mission and we move with him. We, we reorient ourselves to what he is doing. And chapter 11, if you go, I mean, like, we, we didn't read it, but there's just names, 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 names. And some of you are like, thank gosh we didn't read it. Right? All, and pretty much the rest of chapter 11 is all these people that sacrificed and moved into Jerusalem for what God was doing. And God, in his sovereignty and his grace, was like, let's put these names down because God sees our faithfulness. Right? Even though he's the one that empowers us to actually obey and follow him, God is like, man, he sees and cares about our faithfulness and our sacrifices. So we move with him. Next, next thing that we see in, in chapter 12 is God works, so we worship joyfully. Second thing, God works, so we worship joyfully. Verse 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem... They sent for the Levites, wherever they lived, and brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate the joyous dedication with thanksgiving and singing accompanied by cymbals, harps, and lyres. The singers gathered from the region around Jerusalem from the settlements of the, the Nephites. I, I said that right. Um, and then they come from all of these places, places and they, they, they worship God. I mean, I mean no, notice something the wall was built five chapters ago. I mean, usually once you finish it, that's when you dedicate it. But the people don't dedicate the wall until they first dedicated themselves. It's just this, this picture of, man, God is going to rebuild his people from the inside out because this is bigger than a wall. And so this, this is the celebration. They've been dedicating themselves. And so they, Nehemiah, he gathers everyone. Or all of these Levites and these priests that, were, that would sometimes come into the city to, to serve and everything, he's like, no, no, come now. We're all gathering, all hands on decks. And so then, then we see um, in verse 31, then, then I, Nehemiah, brought the leaders of Judah up on top of the wall, right? The wall is so big, it's, it's nine feet wide, they could walk on top of it. And he appoints two large processions that gave thanks. One went to the right toward the dung gate. And, and so, so he gathers these, these two gate, or two processions, these two choirs to go around the city and worship Jesus. One choir goes one way, the other one goes the other way. And just an interesting note here is that they, they, they meet, when, they, when they, these, these two groups, when they meet before they start going around the wall, they meet at the valley gate. Which back in Nehemiah chapter 2, when Nehemiah first gets to Jerusalem and goes out at night, so nobody sees him, and he goes out to inspect the city to see kind of like, hey, what's the shame and reproach of the city? He goes out through the valley gate. And so now, right, it, like Nehemiah is inspecting the city to see it's through the valley gate to see the shame and reproach of the people. But now that things are restored, they meet back at the valley gate because it's like God has undone it. Just neat thing. And, and so when, when they, they, they march around the, the wall and then they meet back and then they go up to the temple signifying that this wasn't done by their strength. This was done by God's strength. And this is about a, being a city of worship. And they're singing loudly. Look at verse 43. And I'd encourage you, underline, circle, highlight, verse 43. On that day, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and the children also celebrated, and Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. I mean, how would you like to be the church that woke up the neighborhood? 
Man, things are rocking. Whoa. You know what I mean? The, the rejoicing. I mean, this is like when you walk outside of the stadium and you could hear the crowd roaring. Music is filling the air. Man, people are worshiping. They're singing loudly. And even the people outside of the city are, li- are hearing their joy, hearing the worship. And here it even says, if you've noticed, it says, women and children also celebrate it. This is just showing and emphasizing that it's everyone. Because in, in that culture, is typically like you'd expect men, you know, to, to be kind of more of the pace setters, more of the ones like, yep, we're going to step up and we're going to help lead this, this worship to God. And, and right today in our world, it's kind of, a lot of times it's the opposite. Right back then, it would have been normal for guys to set in the pace for worship. And a lot of times, like, in church world, it's like the ladies are setting the pace, which is still great. But, you know, but, but guys, I, I just want to just like a little side note, I, I would love to challenge you in setting the pace. I know it's not always easy, but, but you are influencing other people around you, influencing your family. And how can you set the pace in worship? Right, because if you prioritize other things above Christ, you're leading people towards that end. Don't be shocked when they, when they kind of think, well, God's just an option. And you're like, how could they think that? Well, you led them there. You made it an option. Right, you chose hobbies. You chose other things over it over and over and over again. And so just a couple ways for, you know, I, I didn't challenge you encourage you to help and be a blessing to the people around you is one, just make worshiping with the gathered body a priority. Make it a priority. And I would say the other thing is is engage with God. Right? We get jacked about a 19-year-old in tights and a ball (laughs) or some older guy with a whistle. But when it comes to God, the one who has saved us and sustains us, man, engage. Think about what God has done in your life. Worship him. And notice here that in in verse 43, it says that God made them or he gave them this joy. Why? Because God was at work in their lives. That's why they're worshiping, right? Because of what God has done. And it's not just that God gave them a wall and fixed their circumstances. God was restoring them, right? God was restoring them, taking away they, their shame because of, of their rebellion. And God's like, God had been restoring them so that they're being actually who God has called them to be. I mean, have you ever just felt this joy that because God has given you this joy in your life, because God has saved you, because God has shaped and changed you, because God has saved your marriage. He's freed you from addiction. He's shaped you to be more patient. He's shaped you to be more kind. He's given you the fruit of the spirit. God has changed your life, and does that move you to just be like, thank you, God. Oh, man, you're good. Fills you with this joy. And let's be honest. Some, a lot of times, joy is kind of hard. Right? We, we struggle with it. Right? We don't always feel like singing or worshiping. We feel disconnected and just kind of blah sometimes. And I understand that. I mean, we were talking about this in, in city group, and we're like, all right, what are, what are some things that, that kind of tend to do that, that make you feel blah and kind of rob you of joy? You know, somebody just said sin. Right? If, we're, if we're just actively chasing something, some idol, something other than God, that's going to tend to rob you of joy. Because here's the thing. The enemy, sin comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So don't, like, sin will do that in your life. It might give you a little temporary, like, ooh, that was cool. But sin is robbing you of life, of joy, of peace every time. Sin pretty much always turns the focus on you. Second thing that, that, that robs us of joy is, you know, situations, circumstances. Right? When life is great... God is great. When life is rough, God's kind of rough. 
And we, we, a lot of times we think if God would just make things the way that we want them, then we would be totally filled with joy. And we'd be, we'd be such a great Christian then. Here's just a question. Has experience ever actually shown you that? Has experience ever shown you that when you get what you want, that you actually have a lasting real joy? Typically not. Right? When we look at all the people in this world that have a lot of power, that have a lot of money, right? When we look at people in Hollywood or something like that, do they just seem like, man, those are joyful people. Man. They have everything. And their lives are still falling apart. Right? You, you, your circumstances. I totally understand when we have life struggles. I'm not saying that we just put on a happy face and pretend everything's fine. That's not what joy is. But, but at the same time, if you're placing your life, your joy, your peace on you and your circumstances, you and your circumstances are too small to carry that. They're just too small. You are always shifting. Your circumstances are always changing. But God, God is everlasting. God is way bigger than you. God is bigger than your circumstances. Psalm 1611 just says, in your presence, God, is the fullness of joy. Because God himself is the source of joy. God has given us so many reasons to worship joyfully. He's given us salvation. He's given us himself, this relationship. He moves us into a deeper joy that's not just superficial. Right? We, we can have a deeper joy because the God of the universe always accepts me, always loves me, always approves of me, not because of me, but because of Christ. I always have that in Jesus. I can have that deeper joy of in him rather than people's trivial approval that changes from one week to the next. That's something real. That's a deeper joy that we could have in him. And so how, how do we grow in that? How do we have like a deep, how do we grow into having a deeper joy that's not just fabricated, that we're not just kind of like putting on a happy face? A couple ways, real quick. One, one of those ways, dig into God's word. And I know that sounds super churchy, and I'm not saying like, oh, if you just dig into God's word, it's magically going to make you joyful, right? Reading for me is hard. It's kind of, it makes me sleepy. It's not a great thing for my job. And I I sometimes just don't like to read, right? So, but reading God's word is reminding me of truth about who God is. You want real joy, let God show you who he is through his word what is true about him, what is true about you. Second way to grow in joy is thankfulness. Right here here in Nehemiah, they're giving thanks. Even the two choirs that are marching around are, you know, in your scriptures, it probably says that they are thankful processions. That's what they're doing. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And that's leading them to have this joyful worship. Give thanks to God for who he is and what he's done in your life. And that could look in like a variety of ways. Maybe it's getting out into creation and just looking at how beautiful it is or the complexity of creation and just thanking God. Look at what you've made. Maybe it's being with just some good friends, enjoying some good food and just thank you, God, for these people in my life. Thank you, God, for Mexican food. <laughs> it's awesome. Right? Thank you, thank you, God, that I have clean water when I just go to my fridge, when I go to, I have multiple places to get this clean water from, just like that. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I have a roof over my head. Thank you, God, that I have the ability to move, to work, to think. Thank you, God, that I have easy access to your word. Thank you, God, that I know that if something happens, I have a church, a, a, a body, a family that will help me that will come around me in that. God, thank you that my approval of you today does not depend on just how good I am that I'm performing for you, but God, you love me because of Christ, because that's who you've made me. I'm your son. Thank God for all those things because here's what, what thankfulness does. It shapes your perspective. 
It shapes the way that you see God in the world because here's something we're, we're real easy to do. We're quick to complain. Right? Boom. It's easy to find things to gripe about. And whenever we complain, it's always typically about us or about how bad somebody else is. And that shapes our perspective of what we don't have. But what does thankfulness do? Thankfulness reminds us of what God has given us rather than him holding out. It reminds us that he loves us, that he cares for us, that he is the giver of all good gifts. So we give thanks. It's not just a spiritual high, but it's in him. So the people here, because of what God's work, they're worshiping joyfully. Third thing is this that we see in verses 44 through 47 is God gives, right? So, so as God is building, building his people and we see, man, this is who they are. This is what they do. This is their culture. God gives, so we give. God gives, so we give generously. Verse 44, on that same day, men were placed in charge of the rooms that housed the supplies, contributions, first fruits. The first fruits, not just like fruit. It's whatever they've gained, whatever they earned. They're like, hey, we're giving the first back to God. First fruits and tents, the legally required portions uh, for the priests and the Levites were gathered um, from the villages, large fields, because Judah was grateful to the priests who, who were serving. Verse 47, it says they're, they're giving all of these daily portions away. And so they're, they're, what, what they're doing, it's, it's not just like, oh, God's done something. Yeah, let's stir up and give things. Actually, what they're doing is they're giving what was in God's word for them to give. They're going to God's word. All right, God, you've said this. We're going to, because you've given, we're going to give. We're going to follow. We're going to obey. And remember, back, in, back at this time, it's not like people are rolling in the dough. Remember from earlier in Nehemiah, there's a famine. There's the king's tax. People have been away from their jobs, not making money because they've been building the wall. But this is what their lives are about. God, you, you were doing something. God, you have done something. You've given to us. And so, God, we're going to respond to you in worship by giving generously. They had gone so long without a temple. They had gone so long unprotected. They had gone so long without the preaching of God's word. They've gone so long without this joyful singing worship, but now all of these things have returned. They're excited, and they give out of their joy. You know, and for us, I mean, like, Jesus doesn't need our money. He doesn't need your money. I mean, it's like, like as if he needed anything. He's not after your money. He's after something far bigger than that. Jesus is after your heart. G G Jesus, he wants to save you, right? Save you from your sins, but also to, to change you, to shape you. Your, your soul into this loving relationship with him that you're growing more and more into becoming like Christ. So that ultimately is what Jesus is after is your heart. But here, here's the thing. Don't be fooled into thinking that how you spend your money doesn't matter because how you spend your money is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, reflection of your heart. And if you're like, Do you, is that just you, Ricky? No, Jesus says it. Jesus in Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other, right? So it's just like, hey, you got to have a master, pick one. He will be devoted to one and, or, and despise the other. And then he, he says it, you cannot serve both God and money. Right? If, if you love Jesus, if you worship him, your wallet, your finances will reflect that. Plain and simple. If Jesus doesn't have your wallet, he doesn't have your heart. And I know like you're like, well, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. And we'll try to justify it. But again, Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. Notice what he didn't say. Jesus didn't say you can't serve both God and the Greek gods. Right? That was going on at the time. Why doesn't he say that? Because Jesus knows the biggest competitor for your heart is probably money or what you think money will get you. 
can't serve both God and money. You can't be a, like a worshiper of Jesus and where he's the center of your life, but actually secretly it's your security, your comfort, your success, your status. You can either serve one, but you'll hate the other. And notice when we get mad at God, when you don't give me what I want, that's not God's fault. That's an indication that you have an idol in your life. You'll either love one, hate the other. Does God, does Jesus have, like your heart, does he have your finances? Do you give generously to God and to his mission? And I know for some of you, you're like, Ricky, that's what I want to do. Well, how much do I give, right? You know, like, I, I want to grow in generosity. How much do I give? Well, here, here in Nehemiah, it says they gave a tenth. You know, and you're like, well, the tenth is just 10%. And in the, in the Old Testament, that's typically what they gave. They gave 10%. Jesus, in Matthew 23, kind of seems to indicate, a little, you know, at least a little bit, hey, you tithe, um, you know, one-tenth of your mint, dill, cumin, and it kind of seems like, hey, you should do that, but don't neglect the, the weightier things like love, just, love and justice, mercy. So he doesn't just throw out the tenth. In the New Testament, it doesn't seem like that's like the rule is 10%. But what they practice was actually typically beyond 10%. Seems like they were giving even more generously. So how much should you give? I don't know. I'd just say give generously. I think 10% like at least gives you kind of like a decent number to work with, but it's not like the rule. When I was in high school and college, I started giving 10% tithing to, to the church. And I'll admit at that time, it was honestly pretty easy because it was just like, here's 20 bucks. <laughs> oh, I am. I may, I may be covered next month too. <laughs> and then late, later on, I, start, I get a salary job. Shortly after that, Christy gets a teaching job. And then all of a sudden, you're like, wait a minute. Hey, that 20 bucks, Phil, there's not noticing the gap now of 10%. I don't know if I like that. And I'll just admit, I didn't want to give it. I didn't want to do, you know, this was now like 500 plus dollars. I'm like, uh, I didn't wait to obey God. Christy and I, really, really me more so, was like, let's obey God and have God shape, and trust God in faith that he's going to shape our hearts. Christy's heart was probably already shaped and she's godly. And I'm like, I need a little bit of time. But we're just like, God, we're going to trust you in this. And so, so for you, maybe you make a lot and you need to trust and be generous and know that God has given you a lot so you could give a lot and praise God for that and just trust God in giving a lot. Maybe you, maybe you make a little bit. Maybe you just need to trust God to still be generous with your little bit and that he's going to provide, right? God has provided salvation for us. He'll provide our daily bread. And he's not gonna give us everything we want, but he'll provide our needs. And so we give to God because he's given to us. And, and how we give to God, the primary way, because there's lots of different things that we can give, but just if we look at the scriptures, as we give to God, because that's who we're worshiping with our money, the primary way that we give is through the church. And so we give because what he's given us. And so we start off like, what kind of culture, what kind of people would you make? So here's just kind of like a recap real quick of chapter 7 through 12 of these things. Will you go to that, Ed? Sit up there. Cool. All right, so because of Jesus, we want to be a people. And these are all just a, a list of things from chapter 7 12. We want to be people that love and cling to God's word, that we confess and repent with vulnerability and honesty, that we commit ourselves to God. When they made the covenant, we're just like, hey, we're, we're actually committed to God because of what Jesus is and who he's, what he's done. We want to be a people that move with God's mission and sacrifice for it, what we saw in chapter 11, that we worship joyfully we give generously. But how do we actually do that? How do we become a people like that? I mean, first, it's all, right? It starts with Christ. Because of Jesus, we want to be this people. Here's the thing I'd encourage you to be. Will you go to the next slide there, Ed? For it to be a people thing, for it to be an us thing, for, it to, uh, for, the, for these things to be a people thing, it needs to be a personal thing. 
Right? It's easy for us to be like, yeah, we should be vulnerable. So I want the church to be vulnerable. Hey, you want to share your life? Nah. Right? Hey, do we want to be generous? Oh, man, I want us to be totally generous. Hey, are you generous? No. Right? For this to be a people thing, it needs to be a personal thing. It's easy for us to say what we want for the collective, but not own it individually. And so where, where is maybe God, where is maybe just the spirit of God just kind of like revealing something to you, wanting to, to move in you? Because as we live this out as a people, think of how we, as this becomes more and more of a people thing, think of how we encourage one another on in this. I mean, think if the people in Nehemiah, if they didn't own the, the joyful worship, and they're like, yeah, we should worship. All right, see you later. Think of how many people of the city are actually just missing out on reflecting on what God has done because they didn't do it as a people. And so as we own this personally, we encourage the other people around us. As we own this as a people, we encourage the other people around us. And not just encouraging people in the church, but outside of it, right? The people heard, heard them from far away worshiping. As we live these things out and who God has, is shaping us to be, that is a light to the world. Man, look at those people that, man, life is rough, but they have a joy, something deeper that I don't have. Man, look at those people. They're so generous. Look at those people that don't try to pretend that they're better than what they are, but they continue to be humble and move and repent to God. You know, and this chapter just reminds us of even not just like how God shapes us and that we just be, we be these great people, but it points us to the gospel, right? Because we sacrificed, you know, they, they sacrificed for God and they moved from, from the towns back into Jerusalem, but we think of Christ and how he made the, the biggest move in human his, in, in history, right? He had a home, he had an awesome place in heaven, but Christ sacrificed and moved and became fully human, put on human flesh and dwelt among us so that he could make his home in us and that our home would be in him. Right? We, Christ has made the ultimate act and gift of generosity. That he gave not just some money or anything, but he gave himself. He gave his life. He gave his blood so that we might receive what we have not earned, so that we might have what we can never get for ourselves. And that's this relationship with Christ, this forgiveness of sin, this new life in him. He's given us everything. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father God, Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, that, that this all starts with you, that, that Lord, this isn't just us like trying to muster something up and be these people just because that's what we should be, Lord, but it all starts because of what you have done what you are doing. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to constantly just see your goodness and your grace before us. And Lord, I, I pray that, that in this, Lord, that, that you would shape us, Lord, to, to be the people that you're moving us, that you're, you're transforming us to be. Um, Lord, so, so that we can be a light to one another, so we can experience more of life, joy, peace in you. And so that we could be a light to this world. That there are people that actually just look different and, and ultimately that we look like Christ. And so Lord, Spirit, we pray you give us that strength. Give us, give us everything. Give us that motivation to continue to move and to be shaped and to be transformed by you. We ask this in your name.